Okay, welcome to part two. So I now have the full book. Um, so we can now continue. Unfortunately, I don't actually know how to change the layout of the pages here. So we're just going to be reading like this. Uh, I'm very sorry about that. But anyway, let's continue. So Porter climbed up on the stage and started fiddling with the animatronics. Jack got up from his table. I've got to take care of some things in the office, but I'll be back to check up on you. Yes, sir. Porter said, dragging an animatronic centre stage. Once Jack was safely out of earshot, Porter muttered, Somebody must have spit in his oatmeal this morning. This morning and every morning, Sage said. Have you ever seen the man in a good mood? Porter rolled his eyes. Not once. I wonder if he ever is. Maybe when he's not at work? Do you think there's anything he does for fun? Sure, Sage said, looking up from the table he was wiping. He kicks puppies, robs grandmothers, makes orphans cry. Porter laughed. We'd better be quiet or we'll get in trouble. Sage grinned. When aren't we in trouble? They worked quietly for a while. Once Porter had things working on the stage, he felt a strange presence in the room. The hair on the back of his neck prickled. He felt like he was being watched. He turned around and saw he had been right. A little girl around four years old was standing right at the edge of the stage. She looked up at Porter with big brown eyes. Hi, she said. Hi. Porter said. A few feet behind her were a man and a woman, presumably the little girl's parents. Hi folks, he added awkwardly. Customers had become such a rarity that it was always such a surprise when they showed up. The little girl pointed at the animatronic bear. Is that Baron Von Bear? <laughs> yep, that's the Baron, Porter said. Really, he shouldn't have had the curtains closed so that any kids who might show up wouldn't have seen the, anim the characters in their dormant state. Is he going to sing? The little girl said. Yes, Porter said. The first show's in 15 minutes. Is there pizza? Of course there's pizza. Porter swiped a few menus from the host station and handed them to the family. Why don't you folks sit at any table you want and I'll go find you a server. Uh... I don't know how to say this name, so I'm very sorry, but Angie, or Angie, no, Angie. Angie, the only server left in the place, was sitting in the kitchen doing her homework. She was studying to be a licensed practical nurse, she had told Porter, because this restaurant gig was obviously a dead end. Edwin, the cook, was playing on his phone. Hey, Ange, Porter said. You've got a table full of customers. Angie looked up from her textbook. Really? You mean I might actually earn a tip tonight? Porter grinned. It's looking like it. Don't spend it all in one place. Hey, and I might actually get to cook something, Edwin said, pocketing his phone. We need to use some of these ingredients. Half of them are about to go bad anyway. Angie was on her feet. I won't share that information with one table of customers. Edwin laughed. Good idea. A few more families trickled in over the course of the evening, but business was still slow, and Porter spent most of the night trying to look busy so Jack wouldn't yell at him too much. The mood in the place was all wrong. A children's pizza, Emporium, was supposed to be loud and lively and full of laughter, but the only thing you were likely to hear in this place were Jack's outbursts. It was always such a relief to walk out in the fresh night air after closing time, Porter, Sage, Angie and Edwin left Jack and his anger inside and instantly the mood was lighter. Sage, do you guys want to get something to eat? Porter asked. He probably should have... He probably should save what little money he had, but he couldn't face the thought of bolting down another pot of instant... Oh my god, okay, everyone's going to go crazy at me for this. It's pronounced ramen, right? I don't eat ramen. I don't know what ramen is. Raymen. Ray, <laughs> Raymen. <laughs> Another pot of instant noodles in his apartment. <laughs> there were murmurings of agreement. What do you want? Porter asked. Not pizza. Everybody yelled in chorus. It was a running joke. They ate so many leftover slices that they were sick of them, but they kept on eating them because they were free. Actually, paying to eat pizza, even good pizza, had become unimaginable. They ended up at the Golden Haifa, <laughs> even though none of them had enough money for burgers and had to settle for grilled cheese or BLTs instead. They shared an order of fries between the four of them, which the tired-looking waitress placed in the middle of the table. Hey, you guys aren't looking for a cook, are you? Edwin asked the waitress as she set down the ketchup bottle. 
Not right now, hon, she said. But if you want to fill out an application, we'll put it on file. Thanks, I'll do that. Edwin flashed her a charming smile. After the waitress left, Edwin's f smile faded. I tell you what, guys, I'm pounding the pavement to find another job. If you all want to keep on eating, you should start looking too. You think Jack's going to fire us? Angie asked, pouring out a puddle of ketchup on the fry plate. Well, that's a possibility too, Edwin said, sipping his coffee. But I think the place is going to close down before Jack has a chance to fire us. I've worked in the restaurant business a lot longer than you kids have. I can tell when a place isn't long for this world. It gets the stink of death on it. Are you sure that's not just the stink of pepperoni past its expiration date? Sage asked. Same difference, Edwin asked. Uh, said, <laughs> grabbing a french fry and dragging it through the shared puddle of ketchup. If we were selling that pepperoni, it wouldn't be going bad and we wouldn't be in danger of being out of a job. Wow, now I'm depressed, Angie said, stirring her sapro uh, saproda? What am I going on about? Stirring her soda with a straw. No need to get suppressed, Edwin said. You're in nursing school. You've got a good career ahead of you and Porter and Sage are college boys. I'm the only one at this table who's looking down a dead end street. Well, maybe you're not, Porter said. I've just about finished my invention, which will bring the cost of animatronics way, way down. I'm showing it to Jack on Friday. If he doesn't have to keep replacing expensive animatronics, then he can pour his money into advertising and better food quality. Maybe even buy a few new games. Then customers will start coming in again. Well, I admire your optimism, Angie said, popping a french fry into her mouth. I hope it pays off. I think it actually might, Sage said. Porter showed it to me tonight. He's calling it the puppet carver because of my novel. It's pretty amazing, he grinned. The invention, I mean, not my novel. Though the novel's pretty amazing too. Your confidence is inspiring, Edwin said. He raised a, his soda glass. Let's toast to a brighter future. To a brighter future, the friend said, clinking glasses. Porter and Sage shared a two-bedroom basement apartment. From the window, they could see the spectacular view of people's feet walking on the sidewalk above. The apartment was dark and damp, with cheap panelling on the walls and ancient moss-coloured carpet on the squeaky floor. The one thing you could say for it was that the rent was fairly cheap, especially with the two of them sharing it. Tonight was the same as every other night. They got home. Sage went to his room to work on his novel. Porter went to his room to work on designs for his inventions. Porter drew and measured and made notes, working until he was so tired he could no longer hold his eyes open. Then he would collapse into bed, setting the alarm so he would wake up in time to get ready for the morning classes he took before returning to abusive pizza land, as he called it, in the afternoon. It was a gruelling schedule that wore him to the bone, but he kept on pushing. Sure that he was going to find that he was on his way to do something better. Meanwhile, Sage returned to his manuscript, typing in the dim glow of his desk lamp until late in the night. From The Puppet Carver, a novel by Sage Brantley. What do you mean from? the? Okay. <laughs> uh, Sylvester Pine emerged from the chamber as a perfect specimen. The first thing he saw were his hands, which were fully jointed. He watched himself curl them into fists, then straighten them back out and spread the fingers apart. Remarkable, yes, his creator said. Sylvester nodded. Would you like to see more of yourself? His creator asked. Sylvester nodded again. His creator smiled. You are programmed with the power of language, both the ability to comprehend and the ability to speak. When I ask you a question, please answer it with a yes or no. Now, would you like to see more of yourself? Yes. Silver, Sylvester said. The words slipped from his lips effortlessly. Good, his creator said. Follow me. Sylvester let his creator lead him to a large piece of glass he somehow knew was called a mirror. Sylvester regarded himself. He was a complete person with, a symmetrical, facial with symmetrical facial features and eyes that opened and closed. When he wished to move an arm or a leg, it moved according to his unspoken commands. He was not yet clothed, but when he was, he knew that he would strongly resemble a man with one exception. The surface of his face and body, unlike his creator's, was not soft and pliable, because instead of flesh, he was made of smooth, solid wood. 
You're a handsome fellow, his creator said, and a highly functioning one. You can think, you can move, you can talk. You have three of the five senses regular humans have, sight, hearing, and smell. What senses am I missing? His creator shrugged. Nothing's very important. You don't... Oh, sorry, nothing very important. You don't have a sense of taste because you have no need to eat. And you don't have a sense of touch because we haven't been able to perfect the technology yet. But this isn't a wholly bad thing. You'll have no ability to feel heat or cold or ability to feel pain. In some ways, this lack makes you superior to those who have it. Sylvester touched his left hand with his right hand. Then he reached out and touched his creator on the shoulder. His creator was right. Right? His creator was right. Sylvester felt nothing. I do, I do want to say, uh, this part here, for some reason it reminds me of the Afton dialogue at the beginning of Sister Location. You know, when he goes, she can dance, she can sing, she has a kind of equipped with helium balloons. <laughs> you know, it, it's the part where he goes, you can think, you can move, you can talk. You have three of the five senses. You know, it, it has the same structure for some reason, I, I think. I don't know. That's that's a tiny connection, obviously, but um, it just reminded me of that. Before Jack entered the house, he took off his shoes. Becky forbade... Oh, sorry. I, for some reason, I thought it was a name, even though it doesn't have a capital letter. Becky forbade wearing, his sh wearing shoes inside because they might scuff the beautiful new hardwood floors. Jack understood this. He knew how much the new flooring had cost. He had paid for it, but taking off his shoes and holding them in his hands still made him feel strangely sneaky, as though he were a thief trying to break into his own house. He walked into the newly remodelled home. The hardwood floors gleamed. The new living room furniture was sleek and modern, if not as comfortable as he would like. Becky loved to watch all those shows about redoing houses and she had really put her heart and soul into making their comfy older house look elegant and new. But when Jack looked at his plush surroundings, all he could see was money flying out of his pockets. He found Becky at the kitchen table reading a home and garden magazine and sipping a diet soda. Even though it was late, she was still dressed in a designer blouse and dress slacks, her hair and makeup perfectly in order. Ever since she got the house looking the way she wanted it, it was like she had to look a certain way too. No more lounging around in sweatpants, she had to match the decor. She looked up from her magazine. You know, I've been thinking we might want to knock down on a wall before the, between the living room and dining room, she said. Have more of an open concept. An open wallet's more like it, Jack said. My wallet. He stomped over to the refrigerator. New stainless steel and very expensive and looked inside. What was the good of having a top-of-the-line refrigerator if there wasn't anything worth eating inside it? We never have anything good to eat in this house, Jack said. Becky rolled her eyes. I had a fruit smoothie for dinner. I'd be happy to make you one too. That's not food, Jake. Uh, Jake? Jack growled. Food is something you can chew. Becky got up from the table and started selecting fruit from the fruit bowl. Hunt. I know you'd love to eat a big juicy snake steak every night, not snake, uh, but the doctor says it's bad for your cholesterol and blood pressure. A fruit smoothie with protein powder is much healthier, and besides, it wouldn't hurt you to go down a pound size. Jack's head was pounding with both hunger and anger. Nothing is ever good enough for you, is it? Everything always has to be improved. The house, your wardrobe, my waistline, everything always has to be upgraded again and again. Becky was dropping blueberries into the blender. Well, in the case of your waistline, it would be more of a downgrade that's needed. She smiled at him. It was the same smile he, he used to find radiant, but paired with tonight's criticism, it was just annoying. That's not funny, Jack said. Stop making that smoothie. I don't want that smoothie. I'm going out for a hamburger. But your cholesterol, 